the Site C Summit. It's January the 26th, 2018. I'm talking to Chief Bob Chamberlain. He is a Vice President of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. And uh, can I ask you, how do you feel about the recent Site C decision? Well, uh, myself, like many First Nation leaders and Canadians alike, are extremely disappointed in the decision from the provincial government. Uh, of course, my mind turns to uh, the federal government's commitment to embrace and enact the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And of course, here in British Columbia, Premier Horgan has done the very same thing. And with, for First Nation leadership, a lot of uh, initial focus on the UN Declaration is about free prior and informed consent. And quite clearly, uh, West Moberly and other First Nations have spoken in clear opposition. And so I don't see how the government is living up to its commitments to British Columbians that voted for them uh, by making this decision. And now that we've had <clears throat> time to examine the uh, Utilities Commission report, we can see that all this energy that's supposed to be needed could be generated by alternative energy sources at a much less impact to the environment. So in your opinion, there's no need in terms of the generation of electricity to move ahead with this project? Well, what I've read in the, in the report is that the, the, the need is false in terms of the numbers of what's necessary right now. Um, I know myself with uh, many other leaders in British Columbia felt like this was, uh, by the previous government, an attempt to have cheap hydro for the LNG pipe dream that has certainly fallen through the floor now. And, you know, I'm saddened to know that Premier Horgan right now is in China with uh, presidents and companies from the LNG industry and still trying to flog this dog that's not going to go anywhere. Let's hope it doesn't go anywhere. Well, I think now, uh, with what I understand of the global market, with there being such a glut of LNG and the fact that the prices uh, for this commodity have gone through the floor, uh, and what I've read about other different companies pulling the decision to invest, uh, the major investment that's needed for capital to produce this, uh, I don't see how it's going to be a viable industry in any way, shape, or form here in British Columbia. Were you surprised at Premier Horgan's decision? I was. Uh, surprised and very disappointed. <clears throat> I think uh, many people that voted for the NDP, uh, certainly First Nation support that went that way, was a clear reflection of him, <coughs> excuse me, um, a clear reflection of the belief in the necessity of the UN Declaration becoming real and tangible in BC and in Canada as well. And of course we have the federal government's commitment to the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People as well. And where we had six ministers, now seven federal ministers, uh, coming up with the ten principles to advance reconciliation with First Nations. And when you consider that the ten principles really lay uh, the foundation for a, a, an extreme paradigm shift in terms of the governance of Canada and resources and lands. Um, I'm a bit surprised that the government of British Columbia didn't see this as an opportunity to embrace that and enact that in a way that was consistent with their message to British Columbians during the election. Maybe I'm wrong, but didn't the federal government also <coughs> have to make certain approvals on to site for Site C to proceed? Yes, they did. So even with <coughs> the principles, they were able to... That's do. correct. Well, the, the ten principles came about after the announcement. And so the, the troubling thing is, uh, for those that, that supported the Liberal government federally and the NDP government provincially, uh, from First Nation <coughs> perspectives, we heard the right commitments. And the, the First Nation leaders that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to many now, uh, are looking and seeking justice from Canada. And what I mean by that is the Constitution recognizes Aboriginal treaty rights and Aboriginal rights in Section 35.1, the foundation of this democracy called Canada. And then the Supreme Court of Canada has given you know, a, a plethora of, of rulings to give direction to the federal government about how to enact reconciliation with First Nations. And what we've had is generations of Canadian politicians doing the bare minimum. And so now with the commitments to the UN Declaration, uh, to me it, it really signals that, that fundamental paradigm shift in, in how Canada uh, wants to correct its past. And what I mean by that is, is beyond just the apologies for the atrocities of the residential school, uh, the, the dispossession of our lands from our people, and then also the commitment to the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 
And so all the federal and provincial governments have embraced that and want to enact that. And yet, as soon as the election was over and they're in power, we see them do things that are entirely inconsistent with that commitment. And I think that Canadians, you know, when they see First Nations on the protest lines or when they see First Nations in the media because they're in court yet again, I hope that Canadians understand that we are calling the government to account to live up to its very own laws. And I think that that's something that First, First Nations will continue to do because we know without question that we have title to our lands. It's been handed down through generations from the beginning of time for all of our peoples. And the Supreme Court has given direction to Canada that there is the underlying Aboriginal title that must be dealt with. And in that same breath, the Supreme Court talked about the presumed crown title. And so to me, that's a very clear message to the government uh, that they have done everything in their powers to avoid and to do as little as possible. So here we are, the <coughs> NDP has decided quite recently to move ahead with Site C to the... I personally was not surprised, but mm -hmm. many, many, many were. What are the next steps? Well, I think we've heard from uh, Chief uh, Roland today about the court action that's been anticipated and planned for and implemented. And, you know, I, th I am, am just so disheartened that a First Nation that has a treaty with Canada is still going to court to protect what was spoken to, to be preserved for them in perpetuity as a people. And yet here they are, <clears throat> and I've often wondered just, just how much are the Treaty 8 First Nations supposed to give to this economy? This is the third major dam in their territory. And I'm not sure if enough people have turned their attention to the cumulative infringement on their Aboriginal rights that this represents. And so when we start to consider that with a treaty, it really calls the government to task to live up to the treaty that has been signed. Because it was signed on behalf of you. It was signed on behalf of me <clears throat> and all Canadians. And so it's a very uh, sacred document to the First Nations and it's a commitment from this government or previous governments, but certainly the responsibility still falls on the existing governments today. I think a lot of people in BC are not well informed about what has been happening at Site C from the very beginning, but certainly in the last few months when the government was getting inf advice. And what do you think? What do you think of the role of the media in? what has now come about? Well, the media, uh, I wish that it was more, I wish they'd spend more time on substantive subjects. Uh, you watch any morning show of news and it's a 30 minute recycling and you see some coverage of things that really don't matter much. It should be on a variety show, not on a news show. And I think that they could do a lot more in terms of uh, gathering information and disseminating it to people with the goal of informing the public. Because <clears throat> what I've seen now is when you have an extremely complicated topic to discuss, it is impossible to give all the information in a 15-second soundbite. And I think that the Canadians and British Columbians deserve more than that so they can understand what it is of all the implications of all the different decisions on major capital projects. And what we have now is, you know, pablum. And, and it's so disappointing to see that again and again. And instead of really delving into substantive topics and to really give an honest presentation of all the facts. Like this afternoon, hearing about all the financial, you know, with uh, the, the AAA rating and, and so on and so on. Uh, except for the people that are fortunate enough to have uh, CGAs and, and CAs, uh, a lot of that's going to be lost on average Canadians, but it is such an important piece of the rationale about why this project should not go forward. Is there anything you'd like to say to this? Well, I know for, for the First Nation I'm from, the Kwekwesutinu uh, our challenge with the provincial government right now is the fish farm tenures in our territories. And we know the destruction it causes to wild salmon. And we also know that it has an impact on Fraser River uh, salmon stocks. So what's going on in our territory affects all the Fraser River First Nations. And so the potential for infringement is massive. And so we are entering in, we're going to meet with the government about uh, enacting 
uh, a government to government negotiations on fish farm tenures. And we are insisting that it has to be government to government based on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and based upon free, prior, and informed consent. And I think at this point in time, especially on the heels of Site C, there's going to be many British Columbians that are going to be watching to see if this government has actually got the metal to do what it says. Or is it just going to be empty rhetoric to get elected? Are you surprised you're <coughs> having to fight the NDP on fish farms as well? Well, we've had to fight every government since they've arrived. And I have, I, it's just beyond belief. Um, I think about that movie Dumb and Dumber. I mean, every government that comes in, they make these really poor decisions. But with the emerging science that's come about now about the Piscine real virus and heart skeletal muscle inflammation, and, uh, you know, I turn to the federal government and I wonder where is the precautionary principle that's the foundation of the Oceans Act and the Fisheries Act. They've abandoned it. And even though the government's making commitments for science-based decision-making, they're ignoring emerging science and not supporting the leading-edge science, which could give us a lot of answers. So again, it's about, you know, wanting to see the cup as half full and wanting to believe in the government's commitments for a new relationship with First Nations. But when the same old, same old decisions keep coming down, it's really difficult to maintain that view of a cup half full. Chief Bob Chamberlain, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much.